The aesthetic movement of late Victorian England denounced both the despair of religious faith and the passionless calculation of utilitarianism in favor of subjective perception perfected in form by the intrinsic value of art. John Ruskin's lectures on beauty and painted art, interwoven with the poetry of Matthew Arnold and Algernon Swinburne, exquisitely beside Walter Pater's hedonistic phenomenological prose, represent an idea that art is a refuge from the melancholy, doubt, despair, and industry of the Victorian world. The writers and philosophers of this movement held that beauty and art are the highest values since they are governed by our perceptions, in stark contrast to the idea that pleasures are calculated and adjusted to determine whether they are good or bad for the community, and even in contrast to the idea that we are born with original sin. Art for them was a theory of ethics, a mode of behavior, and a religion in itself, for itself. Utilitarianism is an ethical criterion proposed by Jeremy Bentham in 1789 in a book that was later republished with editions in 1822 called An, Edition, An Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation. Bentham was not only dealing with individual behavior and how it relates to the interests of the community, but also with constituting systems of government. His influence remains in both British and American law today. Of interest to this presentation is the second chapter of his book called <coughs> On the Principle of Utility. In this, he describes the principle of utility as the principle which approves or disproves of every action whatsoever, according to the tendency which it appears to have to augment or diminish the happiness of the party whose interest is in question, to promote or to oppose that happiness. For an action to be morally right for Bentham, the consequences of the action must yield, after a calculation of pleasure minus pain, a pleasurable result for the entire community. For example, a king is faced with a decision. A prophet has told him that if he kills a man of his kingdom by punishment of death for no crime, 100,000 people in his kingdom will live. Or, if he lets the one man live, the 100,000 100, will die. Bentham would be obliged by his theories to advise the king to kill the one man because the pleasures of one thousand far outweigh the pain suffered by one man's death, thus devaluing an individual human life. In this section, he asks rhetorically if there is any direct proof for his theories, to which he responds, it should seem not, for that which is used to prove everything else cannot itself be proved. To give such a proof, is as impossible as it is needless. He, like many authors at this time, were aware of a not-so-receptive audience. He continues in Chapter 2, of principles adverse to that of utility, and very obviously explains that any action that tends to diminish pleasure and happiness is a morally wrong action. He denounces religious thought and relig the religious merit and duty to court pain he says that sympathy cannot be a reason for itself to approve or disapprove of an action. In other words, when someone is sympathetic, they hold up their sympathy, sympathy as a sufficient reason for itself, an intrinsic feeling, a subjective feeling. He claims that these people disclaim any necessity of looking out for any extrinsic good, like his principle of utility. Sympathy, sympathy cannot determine what is right or wrong, according to Bentham because it is decided by one's own feelings, not an objective criteria that all can follow. He criticizes an inner moral sense, and thereby would find no value in religious faith. He makes utility his ethics, his religion. The emphasis on the objective is entirely juxtaposed to the subjectivity of the aesthetic movement. Bentham did not expect the reaction of the aesthetic movement, seeking isolation from industry and the objectification of human action, the aesthetics emphatically celebrated nature, beauty found in nature, subjectivity, purity in form, artifice, and sensory pleasure. Termed from the French, la art pour la art, meaning art for art's sake, the phrase stands for a transformation of human experience into a heightened intensification of reality. It is an experience that, unlike mortality, is infinite. It is reducing every perception to the single moment that it occurs, absent of any preconceived thought, dogma, past, or expectation. 
In this sense, it overcomes and minimizes the frustrations with time that plagued the Victorians. Wolfgang Eiser wrote, Time is experienced as an infinite possibility, and art, by weaving together strands of the extraordinary, appears to overcome the contingency of time. Art for art's sake means the triumph of art over reality. This idea is entirely dependent on human subjectivity, except for one objective referent, the concept of beauty. John Ruskin wrote extensively in the praise of beauty. Peter Quinnell wrote that Ruskin was passionately devoted to beauty, not only to the beauty of words, the formal magnificence of buildings, statues, pictures, but to the whole visible universe as it unfolded around him. He lectured to students and wrote several essays about modern painters, all bringing attention to the form of art, how it is immortalizing the subjective perception of the particular moment in nature. As a little boy, he was enamored of geology. He collected crystals, not for their significance in history, but for their beauty, their clarity and purpose, as part of the whole of every sharp edge or translucent surface. He studied the mountains and the clouds, not for their science, but for their virtues, namely, to be pure and to be well-shaped. He believed that all existence was subject to the universal law of beauty. In describing the relation between art and science, he explains that Shakespeare, if studied by anatomy or chemistry, <coughs> would be nothing more than dorsals, vertebrae, 75% water, and 12% nitrogen. Shakespeare, as art for Ruskin, is a powerful aid or record of the importance of Shakespeare's biological life. Art records his passion and his intellect, and functions as the handmaid of natural science. In his series of public lect published lectures, The Ethics of Dust, which was addressed to the audience of young women, he lectures using the Socratic method to teach against religious confession of sin in favor of a code of morals found in examining rock crystals. He explains that purity in substance and perfectness in form are the sources of goodness, not just for rock crystals, but for everything. He explains that all doubt, all repenting, and botching, and retouching, and wonder will it be what it will be to do best to do next are vice as well as misery. He asks them to look at the crystals with a fresh mind and to pay attention to the thoughts that come without being forced, for those are the best thoughts. Ruskin is teaching the young women to refer to their subjective perceptions of beauty, which can be found in the natural formation of the crystals. Ruskin also wrote a lecture called The Storm Cloud of the 19th Century, where he describes the poisonous smoke of chimneys as plague clouds through which no ray of sunshine can pierce. He, like the other esthetes, felt insulted by the industry abuse of nature. Ruskin was an advocate of nature being the primary source of beauty. He wrote in his book, Modern Painters, that there is not a moment of any day in our lives where nature is not producing scene after scene, picture after picture, glory after glory, and working still upon such exquisite and constant principles of the most perfect beauty. He wrote about clouds and the open sky, and that in observing nature, the beauty is in the form, not the substance, in the art, not the science. Art and beauty for Ruskin became his religion and ethics, the way that utility became Bentham's. These are examples of particular art pieces that were studied and critiqued in Ruskin's literature. The picture that is of the river by Prout is Ruskin's protege. He said it, at one point in one of his writings that he wants to be Prout. Walter Pater wrote similarly on beauty and the role of the artist for students of aesthetics. He also agrees that all experience is relative or subjective. He explains that objects should be seen intrinsically. The first step in aesthetic criticism, he writes in the preface to the Renaissance, is to see one's object as it really is, to know one's own impression as it really is, to realize it distinctly. 
He, like Matthew Arnold, praised Wordsworth for his sensing a strange mythical life in natural things, and for his isolated perception that drew strength and color and character from hills and streams, and from natural sights and sounds. He passionately states that art addresses not the intellect, but the imaginative reason through the senses. He advocated pleasure, but not in the objective way that Bentham advocated pleasure. Where Bentham took interest in the community, Pater took interest in the individual human spirit. He wrote, To burn always with this hard, gem-like flame, to maintain this ecstasy, is success in life. He believed that life was not finite, if taken only as reduced to a single moment of perception. In this way, perceiving beauty and art becomes more powerful than the terror of a finite existence. He ends the Renaissance with this quotation. Of such wisdom, the poetic passion, the desire of beauty, the love of art for its own sake has most. For art comes to you proposing frankly to give nothing but the highest quality of your moments as they pass, and simply for those moments' sake. T.S. Eliot describes the last sentence of the Renaissance as a theory of ethics. He states that Pater is not concerned with art, but with life. He explains that Pater's book documented a moment in 19th century Victorian England where religion became morals, where religion became art, when the repudiation of revealed religion by men of culture and intellectual leadership coincided with a new inter renewed interest in visual arts, when men of science such as Lyell or Darwin, men of philosophy such as Bentham, and men of art such as Ruskin were redefining religion respectively by their own various branches of thought. Pater was rejecting all theories of life in favor of the open-endedness and of the undefined and undefinable experience of the human mind. For Pater, art represents passionate experience, giving the moment, as Iser wrote, a density that enables us to forget the otherwise destructive element of time. OED defines the esthete as a person who is appreciative of and sensitive to art and beauty. The aesthetic movement was governed by subjective perception, passion, beauty, and art for its own sake. It was, it was a reaction to the objectivity and the dehumanization of utilitarianism, the deprecation of nature caused by industry, the religious doubt and despair caused by uniformitarianism, and the angst caused by the finite sentence of time. Religion is defined in the American legal system as a shared belief, appreciation of beauty, nature, and the form in which art represents the aesthetic became a theory of ethics, a shared belief, a religion in itself. If time permitted, I would speak more about Oscar Wilde, who had a policy for shocking people. His garb reflected his passionate commitment to aesthetic philosophy often appearing in knee breeches and silk stockings with his hair long and a lily in his buttonhole. He believed in beauty, like Ruskin, and believed in passions, like Pater. He did not believe art was a religion or an ethic, however. He wrote in Critic as, as Artist that all art is immoral. Art has its aim not doing but being, and not merely being but becoming. Art can save society similar to Arnold's line in Memorial Verses 1850, where he exclaims that one can take refuge in art. Finally, I will close this presentation with a quotation from The Picture of Dorian Gray, Oscar Wilde's most famous literary work, which represents the aesthetic movement well. The aim of life is self-development, to realize one nature's, one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. Live. Live the wonderful life that is within you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching for new sensations. Be afraid of nothing. A new hedonism. That is what our century wants. ...mented a moment.